In this video, I explain in a nutshell what dynamic inefficiency is. From the solo model, we know that output per unit of effective labor increases when the saving rate increases. However, what individuals in our models are usually interested in is consumption per unit of effective labor, because that typically enters the utility function. Now, in the following, I leave aside the per unit of effective labor term because it holds for consumption per unit of effective labor as well as for consumption as such, consumption per capita, except for the fact that consumption per capita additionally grows with the rate of technological progress while consumption per unit of effective labor stays constant. But if consumption per unit of effective labor changes, then the same change translates to consumption per capita, except for the fact that this follows a growth trend. Now, the next few figures show how consumption in the solo model changes when the saving rate changes. Here we first see the standard um, solo diagram with output per unit of effective labor on the vertical axis and capital per unit of effective labor on the horizontal axis. Here we have the production function in intensive form. And here we have the capital depreciation and dilution line, which starts at the origin and increases linearly. N is the population growth rate, GA the rate of technological progress, and delta the depreciation rate. Now, if we have a low saving rate in the economy, then we would have um, a gross investment curve that is, for example, like this one here. S1 is a saving rate, but it's comparatively low. So this line intersects the capital depreciation and dilution curve already at a rather low level of capital per unit of effective labor. Now here in this particular case, consumption can be read off of the graph directly as this red line here. So that would be consumption at the steady state, C1 star tilde, for this saving rate, um, S1. And that's basically the difference between total production and gross investment at the steady state. The difference can be consumed. Now if we have a higher saving rate, for example this one here, then we see output per unit of effective labor is definitely higher, but also consumption per unit of effective labor in this case is higher than consumption per unit of effective labor with a saving rate S1. Now, output per unit of effective labor would always grow if we increase the saving rate, but this does not hold true for consumption, which is shown next, where we have an even higher saving rate S3, but we see that consumption as compared to consumption um, with the saving rate S2 is already uh, smaller. So it seems to be that consumption first increases with the saving rate and then decreases with the saving rate. To briefly summarize what we've seen, it's clear that steady state consumption does not necessarily increase with the saving rate. If we have a low saving rate, consumption first increases with the saving rate, but at some point the additional positive effect uh, becomes negative. The additional output that I can produce with higher saving is uh, more than offset by the additional capital depreciation and capital dilution. So if I save uh, a little bit more, then more than what I save is eaten up by capital dilution and depreciation in this case. The consequence that this will be the case at some point, that consumption again decreases with uh, the saving rate, is a consequence of the fact that the production function is concave, but the capital depreciation and dilution line is linear because that increases linearly with capital while production increases in a concave way. So at some point, the increase uh, of production will become flatter than the uh, capital uh, depreciation and dilution line. And then from that point onwards, consumption would decrease for further increases in the saving rate. It's also obvious that for a saving rate of S equal to zero, nothing can be consumed because in the solo model, nothing can be produced without any savings. <clears throat> there is no capital and the production function tells us that there is no production there. With a saving rate of one, uh, on the other hand, it's the same. Nothing can be consumed either because I save everything, but then everything would be saved just to compensate for capital depreciation and capital dilution. So somewhere in between must be a saving rate that maximizes consumption at uh, the steady state. And this saving rate is often referred to as the golden rule saving rate. And we see an illustration 
on the next two slides. So this graph here shows exactly what I said before. We have consumption per unit of effective labor on the vertical axis and the saving rate on the horizontal axis. For a saving rate of zero, nothing can be produced and therefore nothing can be consumed. And for a saving rate of one, everything is saved, therefore nothing is consumed, but everything that is saved is just saved for the sake of compensating for capital dilution and capital depreciation efforts that is there. So somewhere in between zero and one, due to the concavity of the production function and the linearity of the depreci capital depreciation and dilution line, there will be an interior maximum somewhere here. And as it is drawn here, we would have the peak of this uh, curve here, at the saving rate that we denote by S gold, that's the golden rule saving rate. That's the saving rate that would maximize consumption per unit of effective labor and therefore also consumption as such uh, along the steady state, so in the long run. Now, what does this imply actually? Well, it implies that in the solo model, the saving rate can be too high when the aim is to maximize uh, consumption at the steady state. So, from a welfare perspective, the saving rate could be too high. We could save inefficiently much, such that we could actually increase the utility of people in the economy by saving less. Now, that's only on the steady state, but what about the transition period? Now, we know when we start with a saving rate that is below the golden rule saving rate, then we have a standard case in the solar model. If we want to have more consumption in the future, we need to raise the saving rate, and what this leads to is an intertemporal trade-off. We sacrifice consumption in the short run by having a higher saving rate, but then when we have the higher saving rate, then capital starts to accumulate faster, production starts to grow, and in the long run, we would end up with a higher consumption per unit of effective labor, and therefore also consumption per capita level. So when we start in the dynamically efficient um, area with a saving rate that is uh, lower than the golden rule saving rate, we always get such a trade-off. Sacrificing short-run consumption can buy us an increase in long-run consumption. However, what, what's the case when we start with a saving rate that is already above the golden rule? So it's higher than this saving rate that maximizes um, steady-state consumption. Well, in this case, we would really have an inefficiency in the economy, a Pareto inefficiency, because we could actually <clears throat> make everybody in the economy better off by reducing the saving rate. Because if we reduce the saving rate, consumption at the steady state would increase. That's what we've shown, because we are already beyond the golden rule level. So if we reduce consumption, we can go to the golden rule level, so consumption at the steady state would be higher. But also consumption in the short run would be higher, of course, because we reduce the saving rate, so more can be consumed. Now, in this area, the economy is said to be dynamically inefficient. So if we relate this again to the previous graph, if we are somewhere here to the right of the golden rule saving rate, then the economy is dynamically inefficient. It has an inefficiently high saving rate. If we are to the left of the golden rule saving rate, by contrast, the economy is not inefficient. Uh, you cannot have any Pareto improvement because if we increase the saving rate towards the golden rule level, there would always be the initial generations that suffer because they have to sacrifice consumption in order to buy higher long-run consumption. We can illustrate this further by a graph here where we plot consumption per unit of effective labor on the vertical axis against time on the horizontal axis. And here we assume that we start at the steady state, so consumption per unit of effective labor is constant, but then at some uh, point in time, t hat, the saving rate, rate rises from s to s prime. Now we see that initially consumption per unit of effective labor decreases. That's the short run sacrifice I have to make in order to buy consumption in the long run. So consumption at the steady state in the long run would increase. So we have a typical intertemporal trade-off. We sacrifice consumption um, in the short run and gain consumption in the long run. And that's the dynamically efficient case for a saving rate that is lower than the golden rule saving rate. Here, by contrast, we see what happens when we have a dynamically inefficient economy. So the saving rate is already high with which I start. 
at the steady state and if I then raise the saving rate further from S to S prime, then I have the short run sacrifice in consumption, but I even have a long run sacrifice in consumption because the increase in the saving rate leads to more capital depreciation and capital dilution than I can produce uh, additionally because of the higher saving rate. And therefore, I lose out in the short run and in the long run. So I'm dynamically inefficient and could increase um, uh, the welfare in the economy by reducing the saving rate. So that's in a nutshell dynamic inefficiency. With dynamic inefficiency, you could reach a Pareto improvement by decreasing the saving rate. How relevant, however, is dynamic inefficiency in reality? This has been studied in the 1980s uh, mainly, and people have found out that empirically economies do not seem to reach saving rates that are so high that dynamic inefficiency would be a serious concern. However, some economies, such as Japan in the 1980s and China in the 2000s and the beginning of the 2010s, had comparatively high saving rates, which raised some concerns about dynamic inefficiency in these economies. And that might also be one reason why China tries to follow a strategy of kind of quote unquote rebalancing its economy in the sense of generating more domestic consumption, which is nothing else than reducing the domestic saving rate.